appreciate you, you attending. Um, so my topic is actually going to be a little bit broader. As I, st I started to think about this topic, I realized that um, the, the, the question of incentive actually extends well beyond um, just the production of content and, and actually into the consumption of content as well. So I feel at this point that my title is inadequate to the purpose, but you know, I've kept it anyway since you know, I proposed it that way. But I did add um, the word uh, to use uh, as well, so to create and to use, to, to connotate that we're, only, we're not only talking about production, but we're also talking about consumption of, of content um, and the incentives associated with all that. So um, I'm uh, president founder of Demos, which uh, is actually a sponsor of the event here, and uh, a former academic, uh, academic by training um, in the area of political theory, uh, social uh, theory, uh, philosophy. And uh, for that end, I was uh, uh, sort of various publications, so sort of come from it at a, from a content side as well. Uh, but then I launched uh, an, a, com a company 11 years ago, um, and uh, the early part of the company was doing other things, but, but uh, today it services 82 schools across the country providing online bookstores and marketplaces. Um, um, and the mission from the very fir first uh, go uh, you know, has always been to democratize and enhance access to educational materials. Now we do that, um, especially today, by providing a, a, a peer to peer marketplace. Uh, so we talk about textbook production. We've, we've actually been able, on average, to reduce the cost by about 60% uh, by creating a peer to peer marketplace. Won a number of awards for all that. Okay, move on. So what I want to talk about today then is um, the question of incentive, um, but as the question of incentive points actually to some, I think, bigger questions, broader questions about um, the OER movement in general. Um, so what's interesting from my perspective, so coming at OER re relatively freshly, it's about 18 months that I've, I've known about it even, uh, but but have been in this market for, for a while. Um, and I really see this as an auspicious moment, as a, as a transitional moment um, for the question of, of distribution, production, uh, consumption of, of, of uh, course materials, of um, educational materials. Um, but it's driven primarily, the disruption is driven primarily by um, by students who are going online and really crushing the economic model of the physical bookstore. That together with um, the, uh, the incipient use of uh, um, digital materials right, increasingly. Uh, not so much yet the, the OER having an influence on that disruption, but hopefully that will come as well. So, um, but then the question I would pose as a starting point, then, is why um, aren't OERs more widely adopted, if indeed there are such pressures? Right? Uh, OERs have been around for about 10 years. Um, why, why don't we see uh, more adoption of that? Um, well, the immediate answer might be, well, you know, you're just being impatient, right, by posing that question. Um, the, uh, you know, and there's good reason for that point of view, right? The, the, there's a very limited uh, collection of such materials, um, but the pipeline is clearly growing with foundation support. I think we've heard a lot um, in the last few days about the Washington State Initiative, and, that, and that's exciting and taking off. Um, and we've had an OER-friendly administration for only three years, right? So um, actual having funding for these kinds of projects also, you know, auspicious. Um, but there may be fundamental reasons, too, um, for why OER is not more widely adopted. And that's really what I want to address today. Um, so let's start with this notion of OER as both free in, uh, free in these two senses of gratis and libra. Um, 
So I think there's a self-understanding in the movement of, of OER being free in the sense that it's no cost. Uh, it's part of the very definition. And uh, also in the sense of being free to use. Uh, but gratis itself really has two connotations to it. And so to give you an example, uh, if I walk on a beach and I find a shell on the beach and I can pick that up and I can appropriate that. I can take that home and put it on my bookshelf. Right? But if um, you know, I walk from the beach over to a, a shell stand and I see a shell that's very similar to that one, um, I recognize, of course, that that's not free. Um, and it could be that the only thing that that person did um, who is selling that shell is select it, is to pick it up off the beach and say, I think somebody else would find that appealing, which is to say that it could be that nothing else was done to it than a, a, a curation of that, of that object. So when we say that OER is gratis, what I think we're really saying, what I understand it to be, is that we're foregoing ownership, that nothing is required in exchange for our labor. In other words, it's a donation model. And that, I understand it as a donation model. Um, so faculty really have four, there, there are four components for faculty to be engaged with OER. Um, so much of the funding has been focused on the production of the content. But it seems to me, and this is really where it leads to the consumption as well, that it isn't just about the production, but it's the discovery and evaluation, the adaption, of the, uh, the adoption of the contents to specific classroom uses, um, and then sharing either the content itself in a derivative form, or as uh, just information about that content to others. All of these things working together is what makes um, such a movement possible. Content on its own, production of that content on its own, you know, the internet is filled with content that's siloed, that's, that's you know, uh, uh, sort of archipelagos of, of content, right? It's not enough just to have content. Um, so we're then relying on faculty to drive this whole thing, right? But who, who are these faculty that we're looking to, to do all this heavy lifting? You know, this is also a transitionary period for faculty. Um, in 1960, 75% of teaching in this country were full-time um, tenured or tenure track. Um, as uh, by 2009, that dropped to 27%. All right, there's a huge transition going on in this country with regard to higher education, teaching, and faculty composition. So these 73%, right, this is the same, um, you know, it's, it, you know, outsource and uh, downsides, right? That, that, that very idea that was part of corporate America for so long has come right into the heart of higher education. And these em employees, um, you know, uh, are paid for course on a yearly contract basis without benefits, making a third or less, according to the New York Times, of what a tenured faculty member makes. Okay, so 73 percent, and then let's think about the 27 percent. Um, well, you know they're focused on original research, right? They're thinking about teaching and administrative duties. Um, so to have their contributions, um, it's it's very hard to see that on a large scale, um, because introductory survey materials don't usually qualify for the tenure process. Now that's not true necessarily for teaching institutions, but by and large, you, you know, you want to incent the greatest number of faculty to participate in the movement. So if you're really just reducing it to, the, to those institutions and those faculty members who could possibly right, be recognized for tenure by producing such things, I think that's that's a diminution to a diminution too much, right? Okay. 
Um, so the commercial textbook authors then, uh, most are tenured or tenure track, and I, and, and I put Flat World in this category as well. Um, you know, as, as we heard, I think, from Eric Frank, that um, the, uh, they are always looking for the, the best talent they can, they can find, right? Um, and these faculty are typically doing this for the extra income. They're not doing it for academic recognition. In fact, it's really the other way around. The fact that they already have this academic recognition makes them candidates in the first place to become you know, textbook authors and, and, uh, and you know, sign lucrative textbook deals. Right? It's not in, you know, it, they're not bestowed recognition for doing that. They already have recognition, by and large. Um, I think there's a tacit acknowledgement in the OER movement, and I think that it really came through um, in, in the days that I've been here, that goodwill donations are not sufficient, right, to drive through the kind of ambitions that this movement rightly has. Um, the, uh, the, the use of foundation funds, um, state funds, federal funds, for-profit companies such as Flat World, um, in the production of these materials belies the idea that they can adhere to the highest standards without financial incentive. I think that's really important, right? It's a kind of, you know, taking stock of, of the movement where it is today, that kind of tacit recognition. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, goodwill donations don't have a place. It just means that they don't have a place in changing, as being game changers in this industry, right? But the bigger question is, is the donation model in general, right, leaving aside the goodwill aspect, is the donation model in general adequate against the considerable resources of commercial publishers? Um, you know, they have significant advantages. Um, you know, I've been able to sort of see sort of firsthand these advantages. It's not only, you know, really providing the highest quality content and supported by really strong technological capabilities that are becoming increasingly, you know, the thing that drives these companies, right? These companies recognize the limitations of the core textbook and its sustainability for their businesses. They know all that, right? For them, it's about the technology that's built around it that's going to, in their view, preserve their business model. And it's formidable. Um, you know, I, their marketing and sales apparatus is, is similar to big pharmaceutical companies, right? They have armies of sales reps. I mean, there are, I was just thinking about it, one company, Pearson, probably has double the number of sales reps than there are attendees at this conference. I mean, it's huge, right? This is, you know, so the uh, sensitivities also, right? They know their faculty well. They know their faculty. They have studied their faculty very well. And so they know that what faculty really want, they, they, these adjuncts want the pre-digested material, they want it packaged, they want it ready to go, because you know what, they have five different things to do. And um, if you can give them integration of assessments and other ways of reducing their workload, so much the better, then they're all for it. And that's what these publishers are really keyed on, really focused on. Um, faculty are also sensitive to book prices, and they become ever more so because of the publicity and, and, and really, truly, the pricing pressures that, that, that okay. Um, but they are still more focused on, on the quality of content, okay. So for, for our part as a company, uh, we're about to launch an adoption tool that actually allows, for the first time, uh, faculty to contrast and compare um, commercial materials with OER content all in one place. 
um, and there are lots of sort of metrics that we're providing so that they can just do side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, faculty reviews, adoption information at different institutions, um, affordability ratings on all the texts. I mean, just uh, you know, lots and lots of really good data. I think that'll help them make informed decisions and try to and try to bring some transparency to the process. Um, but the faculty attitudes to um, the LMS may actually be a harbinger for what's happening in the OER movement itself. Because if you think about it, the faculty are really concerned with questions like, you know, in the case of an LMS, does this improve my productivity as an instructor? You know, can it help me reduce my workload and make teaching a bit easier? You know, will it produce better outcomes and make, uh, and make me a better or more successful instructor? Right? These are the kind of questions that faculty are really focused on when they think about adopting a new technology or think about um, using a new source of content. And I think that there's a risk that OER sort of comes into a role that is not dissimilar to how o o uh, LMSs are used today, which is to say they're used, but used very, in, in very discrete ways. Right? In, in, uh, the vast majority of the capabilities of an LMS uh, go unused. So is there a drifting to a rapprochement between, um, well, from there. Um, between, um, I should uh, just disable that, uh, between OER, it seems to me that there could be a drifting toward a, a sort of middle, uh, free and open, may need to make some compromises in the name of quality, where, and, 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 and commercial publishers uh, may need to respond to the market conditions and the pricing pressures by reducing their costs and becoming more flexible uh, with their, their content licenses and so on. Uh, but the question for me is, can the OER, if that's the case, can the OER project uh, nevertheless maintain what I take to be one of the most important qualities, which is the ability to freely remix, combine, and share materials, right? How do you preserve that in this context? Uh, so I think OER is a future. I mean, everybody here agrees, believes it has a future, but the question is really how large. Um, direct, concrete benefits, improved academic life. If it, it will be large if it does these things, right? Financial incentives need to be in place, not just for the production, but also for the curation, organization, and uh, uh, distribution the, uh, of, of these materials. And here, I think, is a, is a critical difference that, that I have, uh, you know, the comments that I've heard at this, this meeting. OER, I don't think, will come into its own unless and until it view, its mandate, its project, is about not being as good as the commercial material, but it really has to be better, you know. And that, in my view, means that we stop looking at uh, the core textbook as just a commodity, right? I heard this morning um, someone said it, it was it's just a commodity, you know, and it's just about price. Well, that may be the starting point today, but, you know, through innovation, imagination, you know, those core texts really ought to be something quite different. They ought to become something quite different. And part of, in my view, what OER should be doing is actually helping that come about, right? Okay, so, and I, and I think there's really just an open question uh, about whether or not states and the federal government uh, can support this. I mean, I personally support a single-payer system for health care, but, you know, look where that went. So, um, the question is, you know, so not all good ideas are funded, right? And they may be funded for a short time, and then the political winds change, and then then, you know, a movement that's dependent on that is, is then really hamstrung. Okay, well, thank you. Do we have time for any questions? Five minutes, okay. Any questions? Okay, you're all convinced. <laughs> I know somebody who works in academic publishing, um, 
And his kind of take on this is that the publishers will always be doing something that other people aren't in terms of, as you say, having these resources available to them to do the kind of sales and marketing, to do the curation, to have you know, the analytics coming back from the journal, hits and stuff like that. Um, is it a mountain which is too big to climb to actually break the hold that they've got? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think there are lots of... First of all, I would say that um, you know, there's no... I can't think of an example of a, of a, of a successful um, open source movement that isn't at some point um, made more efficient, more competitive in the general marketplace through sort of private enterprise. And I think that that will have to happen here. But that doesn't mean that you follow the traditional publisher model and, and sort of replicate that structure. It can be hugely disruptive at the same time. Um, and I, but I do think that it's going to need a partnership with, um, you know, because these things are really expensive to do, right? And I just don't think the nonprofit world and even the state-funded nonprofit world really has the wherewithal on its own to, to confront this. But it's absolutely doable. So, as an adjunct faculty member, I was, I was struck by the fact that I would never use a textbook because I'm much too busy and it's just too much work to adopt a textbook and to teach them. Instead, I rely heavily on my own materials and primary source materials. Um, and, and, and you're at this it, conference. Yeah. What's that? And you're at this conference. I'm at this conference, right, exactly. And, and and so where do people like me sort of fit into the analysis that, that adjuncts well, 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 Yeah, so what, what I'm getting at is, is that's still an anomalous position, right? I mean, the for the vast majority of faculty, they take precisely the opposite view, which is I'm just too busy not to adopt a textbook, right? Not to just take this prepackaged, pre-digested survey of material and just teach from that. What you're describing to most people sounds more time consuming. Yeah, since so, so you've been talking to people, do other people like me show up, or am I just really, really yeah, here? Yeah. So what's the. What's they do, the they do. But, but the question is I mean, we're, we're talking about an industry, I'm, I'm talking about macro chains. I'm talking about, you know, there are 100, 120 million books circulated to students every year, right? That's what I'm talking about. Um, I'd like to see, a, you know, an OER movement that actually addresses that. And, and I don't think that it can do so, um, you know, within the sort of this narrow framework of, of, a, of a donation model. So, um, you mentioned, like, maybe an incentive being, like, prestige. Do you have any uh, thoughts on, like, what that actually might, how that might play out? Yeah, I, I don't think that's, I, I, think, I think it's, you know, it's crass, you know, financial incentive that it's going to attract, you know, the most capable, the best um, authors uh, to contribute to this. That, I, I think it's as simple as that. But it isn't just about the production, it's also the consumption, it's also about the curation. And those, need, those incentives need to come into play, and those need to be thought through as well. So what do you think those incentives might be? Like, I mean, like, so I, I'm just like some adjunct faculty. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a lot of my time to curate. The yeah, work, that's the right. Work. How? Yeah, what would my incentives be? Like, where, uh, well, there could be institutional incentives to do that, right? Um, you know, the, um, the, that that are, that are supporting a faculty member. Um, the question is, I do think it comes back to a personal incentive for that instructor. You know, and I think you know, I could think of various kinds of personal incentives for someone to do that, but that likewise takes resources. So it gets back to their earlier point that this has got to be something that is solved both in both the private and the public sphere. All right. So I just have a question. Would you say that this model that you're talking about applies strictly to higher ed or, or secondary ed? We have at the Open High School of Utah, my, two of my teachers are here with me. We create our own content. Uh, we use state tax-funded dollars, uh, and it's it's a successful model. So I'm curious yeah. as to how this model that you're talking about would apply to secondary. Yeah, that's a fair question. I think the uh, the dynamics in um, 
you know, primary and secondary education are really quite different than higher ed, primarily because um, you know, the, the burden of buying books is mostly on students in uh, higher ed and not so much in, uh, in, in primary and secondary school, right? Um, so, you know, we work with a number of prep schools where the students or the parents, you know, do have that obligation, and that's where we come in and try to lower costs. And, and, in, and so I would qualify that, I guess, and say that for the prep schools, um, you know, those are more analogous to higher education than, than what you're describing. So it's just indirect because the tax... I mean, the parents are the taxpayers yeah. with which the state schools are funded, with which the textbooks are purchased. Right. So. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, we're, uh, oh, yeah, one. Oh, one, one, any, okay. Good. Okay. Great, thank you. Oh, one one? we'll take one. Um, what, um, what do you, what is your opinion about how it's going to play out? What do you see? What do you think is the most like? I mean, I'll a lot of different things, but what, I don't know, what's your vision? Sorry, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I think that there's, there's an opportunity for um, a for-profit business model in this that just aligns interests in whole new ways and uh, is incredibly disruptive to, to this market. I think that, uh, I, you know, there, that's what I would hope to work toward myself. Um, and encourage other entrepreneurs and uh, you know people who are really thinking about this market to help solve these issues.